Welcome to Old Mate Yarns, episode four. I'm Mitch. We've got Dean playing Kit Savage, leading man. We've got John playing Nigel and Nigel the Nihilist. And in the background, Big Terry. You may recognize. And we've got Mason Velios, composer extraordinaire. And in the background, we have Barry. We have Barry the Raster Penguin. Valve. I feel like I want to hear uh, the theme to um, Game of Thrones on it. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> How shit was that last note? <laughs> One of my mates in um, uh, high school who was a really good, really good guitarist, played in a bunch of metal bands. And he he'd um had this tiny one of those tiny little uh, flutes, and he'd just teach himself shit at school. Mm. You're just sitting in class, and you just hear do 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 do. Oh, Lord do, do. Of the Rings. Oh, that's my favorite, I reckon. Bit of fucking Lord of the Rings. Nice, so sweet. That's a one. So thrilling. Although during school, that would be interesting. <laughs> just hearing it randomly in maths class. What you would hear in my classes is us impersonating the gas tats every time the teacher turned around and faced the board, like as if we'd been turning them on and off. It'd be like a symphony of... I can't do it now. Like as if we were turning them on, and as soon as he turns back, we'll stop. Like, we're not... <laughs> I apologise to that science teacher. I don't remember cheeky his name. Little, cheeky little prank. Probably had a nervous breakdown. Sorry, dude. There you are. <laughs> We had uh, all sorts of rogue stunts at, the, at one of the uh, muck-up days, it's like Year 12's final day. Um, we had a winery next door to the school, and it was like a, like a mid uh, chest-height fence between the, the school and the, and the winery. And uh, so they, a bunch of blokes lifted, like Year, year 12 guys, all, all the kind of gym blokes, lifted one of the, one of the teacher's mini cars like, over the fence. <laughs> and it was like a simple <laughs> move, but then... Getting out of that winery was like <laughs> absolute mission. I did that. I did that to one of my mates' uh, car. This girl, she had this tiny little ute, and you had like um, four parking spots. There was like someone here, she was here, no one there, and someone here, and just picked up the back of the ute and just twisted the whole thing forty-five degrees. <laughs> had about this much space between <laughs> cars when he was, came out to drive a car home and was just like. Yikes. Yeah, saying, what, what are you fucking you can't. just laughing? <laughs> oh. Our quadrangle had like a raised cement area where they do the speeches and that on. We lifted the teacher's mini onto that. <laughs> we may just lift it off it at the end because there's no way you could drive it off it. How good was this? Ride a passage, isn't it? Moving cars. <laughs> Minis specifically. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no one's moving fucking Range Rovers. Um,. Okay, my, I just had something rendering, so I'm just closing this down, and we can jump into questions. So we've actually had uh, posted a few things on um, Reddit, oh yeah, of uh, all places, and we've had pretty, pretty good uh, feedback, pretty good support. Um, let's just see if any more questions have come through. Where, where did you Reddit. post to? It's a subreddit called uh, Filmmakers. Yeah. And there's just a lot of people who are, you know, all sorts of stages of of career. Um, all different, you know, spanning a lot of technical roles, a lot of DPs and directors. Um, yeah. But yeah, all sorts of all sorts. But um, we've had a few questions from Reddit, um, so I thought I might just jump in and, uh, and ask you guys uh, some of those. So first one: How do you stay creatively energized? I don't. It's <laughs> fucking tough. At I the just moment, let it run. Yeah, at the moment, because I'm. I, th- I think you stay. Motivated by if there's nothing going on, <laughs> just just be creative, creative in your own right, and start something like old oh, mate or, or you know I'm writing this country singer film, so I'm, I feel incredibly constantly bombarded with um, inspiration to create. Mm. <clears throat> Do you find? Um... Do you find even when you're in the middle of creating, sometimes 
all of the passion for it evaporates and you find yourself halfway through something that you need to finish that you just don't have the just uh, mental strength to kind of... Sometimes stretch. yes and sometimes no. Like I, I sometimes will think I'm onto something with a song and if it doesn't just flow and sort of go somewhere, I'll just go, no, fuck it. And you can hear me say, no, fuck it, that's shit. Like on the re- recordings, mm-hmm. on my voice recordings and I just yeah. put, put the guitar down. Um, but other times, like yesterday, I was just consumed and I went from start to finish like quick. Because mm-hmm. I find that's when it <clears throat> that's when it works is when you just have this passion that just drives you all the way through, mm. and you sort of don't even have to think about it. Like it just pretty much makes itself. You're just sort of there to <laughs> witness it. Your hands are sort of doing. It, and you're like, oh, okay. This Although some ideas, out. some ideas, I feel like have a different way of a, like a weight to them. Mm. I know I have some ideas that, oh, I do, I, like what you were saying before about recordings, like, in the moment I'm like, oh, I don't know, like, if, it's like, it's not the right bedding or the, the bed mm-hmm. frame for yeah. that moment, but mm. if it's recorded and you, you can actually pick it up at a later date, some yeah, ideas oh, I yeah, totally for agree sure. with you, it is like, fuck it, it is like, nah, but it's nice that it came out anyways. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, just, yeah. It's, it's like this, uh, I find sometimes certain ideas have a different like uh, um, I wouldn't say emotion but they have a different character to them mm-hmm. they, like, they need more of you and sometimes mm. like you said before Mitch it just flows out like you're the vessel and it's just sort of pouring through you yeah. such a um, blessing when it works like that <laughs> when I studied when I studied abroad one of the one sentence I always bring this up with Mitch one sentence that keeps sticking with me from one of the people is um, you're like you're you're touching into your creative pool. It's like a pool of all the stuff you know, and you can you, uh, things add to it. But like you sort of dive in, like you're not in control. The pool's always there, mm-hmm. um, and that's why I like to look at it from this perspective of you, you kind of you can never really describe what you're doing when you're no. creating. It's like you are under control, um, or you're just in it, like you're swimming, swimming mm. in the creative pool. Um, and you're just living it. And sometimes, like like you said before, sometimes it's just late at night and you're like, <clears throat> might not be in the mood to, like the idea's like running, but you can't can't mm-hmm. give it at all. So that's why sometimes recording it. In yeah, the yeah. moment you can be like, fuck it, but sometimes I've been able to <clears throat> listen to it. Oh, yeah. When I feel like I'm ready uh, yeah. and I'll hear it differently and be like, oh, no, nah, no, nah, mm. this this is a great idea. Yeah. Um, mm. At the time, I just, I just didn't, it didn't need me at the time. The idea was sitting in the creative pool. Yeah. So Mason, I, I, how about, t- oh, go, go on down. You go. No, no. When I, when I do abandon a moment, I, I, I will not uh, delete that recording. Like, so and with what you're saying there, like, mm. I will go back and I'll be like, oh, you know what, there's a nugget in there that, that may generate something like down the track. So yeah, for sure, I agree with that. There's something mm. about mm-hmm. it, like, just getting it down, getting it out. Uh, yeah. I feel like there's an important part to it. I, uh, I've mentioned you and I have spoken about this saying once about the amount of your work, the nature of what a percentage of it is actually good. And part mm. of me feels like um, sometimes you just need to get stuff out, some recordings, mm. stuff, even even the backlog of music we've done on Old Mate. There are some that are just like, why? Mm. Why? There's a, great, there's a great graph of um, composers throughout history, like all the greats and just hundreds more that we've never really heard of. And it correlates pretty strongly between, you know, the amount of, you know, songs. When I say song, I mean, like, you know, classical compositions. They're not just like, you know, four chords repeated over the length of, you know, three, four minutes, but it's, you know, Bach, it's Beethoven, you know, so it's how many compositions they've created um, versus how popular they are or how, you know, what sort of legacy they've, oh, yeah. they've left. And it's pretty much linear. There's a few mm-hmm. outliers of someone who hasn't done that much, but is really famous. Yeah. But generally, all of them, Mozart, Beethoven, Bach, all of them, um, they just produced such massive quantities of work. Mm-hmm. 800 so plus so compositions. Yeah. And you don't hours. remember most of them because some of them were actually really shit. But then there's yeah. a handful that just left mm. such a lasting legacy because they've created so much that they've cracked onto yeah. some ideas that just hit the, hit the nerve. Do you know what I would love to... If we could ever ask those fellows through AI in the future, <laughs> if they even like the ones that they're famous for, 
Yeah, probably if not. Have, hey. If you think about a lot of those pieces, none mm. of them are from Mozart or Beethoven themselves. They're only our interpretations from the writings that we've kept. Like, do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Imagine if mm-hmm. they were like, oh, that should actually be a <laughs> hell of a lot faster. And you guys just have it you wrong. You guys have done I, this all wrong. <laughs> I know I wrote it that way on the score, but uh, I just wasn't feeling it. So the fact it's that terrible. you've interpreted it that way, you know what I mean? Like, that would be mm. interesting just to know. For sure. That would be very weird to, to see what they think in today's <clears throat> age of music. <laughs> whether, whether, yeah. <laughs> what, what about you as, oh, far as, as writing, script writing? Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely find, I mean, there's, if it's my own project, you can sort of put it aside and just wait until the creative juices come back. Um, there's a great quote, I think it was Stephen King, who actually said, um, always leave a little bit in the well. So when, as, when you're going through the process, um, when you're quitting for the night or something, sometimes there's this f- feeling to just, like, commit and just, like, just give it your all and, like, fucking stay up till 3 a.m. or whatever and just keep going. Um, but I find that if you, like, absolutely just drain the well, then it takes time to build it back up. But if you leave a little bit of enthusiasm left and go, I'm going to come back to this later <coughs> while I still have a little bit more than I was yeah. going to do and haven't done yet, then you can come back to it still energised. Uh, and then the other one would be um, a lot of people have the perception that um you need to get motivation to do something first and then momentum starts to build after that mm. i tend to find it's the other way around and this isn't really my idea i've heard this a bunch of places but um you start building momentum first you just get it rolling you just fucking right here we go roll up your sleeves do it you don't have to feel like it and then mm. once you're into it maybe an hour then you start finding the motivation and you start caring mm. and that one is definitely probably the one for if it's not really your project i find sometimes it's kind of hard there is a deadline, you have to get it done, and you just do not have... But it, you still have to give the creative part of yourself um, to do it. And so if you're not feeling it but need to get it done, then definitely just going, like, all right, I'm just going to start and then yeah. get into it. And then eventually the sort of the motivation kicks Happy. in and eventually you start yeah, caring. I've heard um, Stephen King say that, um, that don't mm. force it and I like, just don't do it if it's not there. But I've also heard other writers say that <clears throat> they force themselves to, like, I'm treating this like a job, so I'm writing for six to mm. eight hours a day, like... Regardless, yeah. Regardless, yeah, I've heard of that. And both roads, that. both roads go to the summit, right? Like you know, one of them yeah. takes longer, one of them produces more shit work before you end up getting there. Mm-hmm. Um, I think ultimately they have different advantages, and it's up to everyone's process. But I think the, I think the, the common denominator is so far is just do it, <laughs> like just make Absolutely. and keep making and don't uh, stop I, making. I definitely agree with that. I used to, I have a few jams with a few mates back in the day, and we would lay down mm-hmm. just twenty-two minute, just like rah. Stuff mm. art at like paint, throwing paint at the canvas, basically. Mm. Mm. And you said it so before, Dean. Sometimes there's little nuggets, and yeah. if it takes 22 minutes to get 10 seconds mm. of what could be something you never would have thought of because you didn't do the 20 minutes, or yeah. simply like what you said, Mitch, because you just didn't start. Yeah. I have heard of that philosophy of just doing every day, mm. and I do believe that in that you would see the percentage of that over time would get better and you mm-hmm. just yeah. start churning better stuff yeah, absolutely. every day so it's almost in itself an experiment um oh, absolutely to sort of just be like just do it if you do it if something will come of it regardless mm-hmm. yeah like our random little things while i was you know between freelance jobs and mason you were uh I know you're doing doing all sorts of all sorts at the time, but still managed to find time for it somewhere. We made those rogue little experimental short films, and then you know what is it? Three, four, five years later, one of them gets picked up for TEDx. Yeah, that was what? that was funny. <laughs> that was just in between the the life, just in between just, life. Yeah. We just did that, and it was there was no, I don't know, that was fun. It was just thrown together. I feel like that's another way that like art like speaks to you. It's kind of like saying it almost drags you into it. Sometimes I find, mm. <clears throat> um, sometimes, like you said, Mitch, there's a deadline. Sometimes we have to turn the switch on, and we've all learned that ability of being able to turn it on and rock up. Sometimes that switch just turns on, and you're it's like, just, oh, it's, oh. It's hard when yeah. the Isn't task it? is creative, and you have yeah. to turn it on, because it's like if it's, a, if it's just a technical task, it's like you don't have to yeah. bring anything other than your hands and your sort of hand-eye coordination to it. Um, but if it's something that you got to like produce something clever and novel <laughs> out of nothing and you're just not feeling it, it's, uh, it can be grueling. How about you, John? This is, I was going to say, um, 
I think it was like Taika Waititi when he someone asked him, it was kind of a jokish, but it's also not. They were like, what is, what what to you is writing? And he just said, uh, like sitting in front of a blank screen, a blank document for an hour and a half until something happens. And um, I think this, yeah, what you were saying before about just sort of like, you know, ideas that stay in your head are just that. And so if you kind of... Yeah. And even if you're not feeling it, if you just sit in front of the screen, you know, I've, I've been trying to write a bit and, uh, yeah, just sitting there and just reading what I've already written going, fuck, man, this is bullshit. And then you just read along <laughs> something will click or look at notes. And mm-hmm. go. But I, I, another bit of great advice that I got ages ago that I try to uh, try to keep on me is um, bring a notepad with you everywhere you go. It's, it's like, you know, you'll be doing, you know, reading a script or whatnot or nice and fucking stuck on it and don't know what the fuck you're doing and then the next day you're at work or you're down the street and you just go oh fuck but um so I've got fucking uh, I've got a couple of fucking books of notes and shit that are just like shit that just comes to you through the day and uh, Mm -hmm. I I always find that even if it's chicken scratch and, and shit and stuff all over the place when I go back to reading a script or trying to sort of figure out what the fuck I'm writing at just like looking at that notepad and just trying to piece together something from it to kind of uh, just spark some thought and get that mm. on a roll. And, uh, Notepads are a secret weapon. There is a lot of neuroscience, um, uh, many neuroscience studies talking about the link between your mind and your hand specifically. And I don't know if it translates the same with typing on a computer screen. I don't know if seeing the words pop up in front of you <clears throat> while you're doing a disassociated task, I don't know if it, I don't believe it has the same effect. Um, whereas actually hand creating the meaning itself, there's something to like that. It's, it's not even, it's not even hand and eye coordination. It's like hand and mind coordination. Um, where if you strengthen that muscle, your ability to make ideas coherent, and just get them out of your head and sort of put them over there and then they, they stop running around. Yeah. Um, there's yeah, a lot of proof to suggest that that's a, just an objectively great idea for mm. any, any field, really. Just, uh, just even <coughs> mental health, just getting it out of your head onto paper. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And if you do get, like, a, a moment of inspiration that just comes out of nowhere and it seems amazing, like, I quickly really have to put it down. And I put it, I put it down on the voice memos. Even if it's just like a lyrical idea or whatever, like, yeah. just like boom. Like, uh, do you label do your voice memo team? No. <laughs> <laughs> do you? Nah, I'm re- recording 57, and I'll just remember what 57 is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that. There, are times that or... yeah. there are times that I don't, and there are other times I'm like, hang on, I fucking look forever for that last one, so I'm writing something here. This one. Yeah, I I never used to, but then I started doing this advertising campaign with uh, Kaylee Cuoco, the Big Bang Theory chick, and I had to put down the scratch voiceover for it. Then they're going to get it recorded later because um, yeah. they keep changing the script. And so, because they're up to round seventeen of the script for this campaign, and so I'm just like re-recording shit every half hour. And so I've just got like a million. I've just lost everything else in the in the clutter of all this bullshit. So I definitely need to start. <laughs> I actually labeling tell, them. I tell. I speak to myself. Knowing I'm gonna to listen to it because I know I won't label it. Yeah. So or your the, dog. So at the end, <laughs> Drink no, more I'm water. Not, I'm not joking. I'll be like, so let me explain this idea to you because I know you're not gonna understand. I love it. Maybe you will. Like I'll be talking to myself. I love it. And I'll be kind of like, in my language. And sometimes, as it comes out, I'm like, no, I know I'll understand. I will. Yeah. I yeah. will when I listen back. But to other people, it's like, go here, do the third thing. You know mm. what I mean when you yeah. scrunch the hand. Put it there. Then put a C major 7 9 or something. Mm. And then dot, dot, dot. You have it right. You can figure it out. And then I'll give myself a little pep talk. And I when it. I genuinely listen to it afterwards, it's a bit of the transfer of energy from that moment, like what you said, mm. Mitch, of leaving a little bit behind. I try and put in a bit of the enthusiasm of what I had at the time. That's brilliant. brilliant. The person that couldn't finish it, the version of me that couldn't give it time, yeah. and speak to the now version of myself that's looking for it, mm-hmm. and being like, you know what I mean. It's kind of like I'll say that to myself, and I'll be like, I no, it. I do, and I can jump back into that character. I guess is another way of looking at it. 
Mm. Yeah, that's, that's really clever. Just sort of, yeah, that, that sort of res- residual energy. Yeah. But the title of quote. Recording 57, that's it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've got the, the um, number 202 comes into my head when you say that. I have to go back and check why later. <laughs> <laughs> what is Dean's recording of 2002? No, two, uh, 202. Yeah, I, don't, I don't remember. 202. 202. I would Secret also say to, <laughs> yeah, to the person that asked the question, I find sometimes, and this sort of, I was listening to the audio book by Rick Rubin, the record producer. Mm. Oh, yeah. Creativity, yeah, yeah. It's incredible. The Art of Creativity, something like yeah, that. Yeah, I think The Creative Mind, I think it's called, it's something like that. Mm. Uh, oh. he, he's sort of about okay. being able to be in a state to receive inspiration and uh, to be, be in the moment, live in the moment. So when I go for a, 45 minutes the creative or an hour creative act oh is it yeah um when i go for like my 45 to an hour walk in the morning to cardio i sort of um multitask and also i try to just be very in the moment and not think about oh, what stressful shit have i have got going on that i need to deal with i try to just sort of be in the moment smell the flowers look at the lake or whatever and I do find on those walks, a lot of the times, inspiration comes because I'm open to it, mm-hmm. being in the moment. So that's Walks are uh, historically one of the main answers to a question like this. A lot of philosophers, a lot of musicians, a lot of authors, yeah. um, a lot of thinkers, they say walking. Mm. Uh, walking or having showers or just doing that, the sort of the getting out of your rut, getting out of your ordinary environment and just mm. going somewhere yeah. tranquil without a lot of shit coming out. Having out. a shower out of a normal <clears> environment. <throat> Aaron Sorkin has about six showers a day because when he comes out of the shower, he's refreshed and he's in the new kind of space. Wow. Yeah, wow. What, um, what kind of thing, what kind of project are you writing, John? You mind saying? Or? <laughs> yeah. Obviously, don't give away um, too many spoilers or anything. Uh, well, it's a short film that's sort of based on partially my own previous experiences with life. But um, I'm trying to do a little bit of when they, when they say, write what you know, and I'm just like, the fuck do I know? Mm. But, um, yeah, that's all I want to say about it right now. Yeah, fair enough, dude. <laughs> no, that's great, man. Okay. I've, yeah, I just want to look at, because I've also just got a new computer and, and the one that can actually run DaVinci Resolve, so I've been fucking... Oh, uh, yes, I saw that video. Fucking around with edit, you know, with, with that. And uh, does anyone, anyone who's... Use Studio Binder. I have a little bit of experience. It's, with it. it's a web-based sort of uh, um, uh, program that you you can use for screenwriting, and then it has a whole bunch of other tools for being able to actually produce a, a film, and whatnot. So, Sweet. and um, I had had a spark for this for this sort of short film. This sort of you know how you have like an idea for a for a short or an idea for something, and you start writing that, and you're like, oh no, that sort of source idea of that would be better in a project like this. And, yeah. I only did that about 20 times for Old Mate over the course of about five years. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was there. I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when it was... But yeah, it's... I'd love, uh, I'd love to read it when you're ready, man. Yeah, you're no worries. Sharing it with anyone. Yeah, yeah, for sure. No, I'd like well, to write some music for it. That's the first thing Can't wait to see more? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, um, yeah, because the, the sort of main... The main, yeah, I'm being very vague here, but like the main character of it is uh, somewhat based on experience of mine own, but but different, different, different enough. Yeah. So it's like, and, uh, but, and and also like one of the main birds in it is uh, sort of loosely inspired by 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 the missus, and um, yeah, yeah, nice. And the her just knowing her and, and meeting her sort of I took an, an original kind of idea for something and it was like oh it would be great to have someone like that but mm-hmm. um, anyway but uh, cool sounds no, great more, yeah, it's all, all very purposefully vague but uh, you're of a little bit more yeah, yeah. When, I've, when I've kind of a bit more comfortable with fucking putting it out there <laughs> get it man I get it yeah, yeah can't, right. wait to, can't wait to see more mm. absolutely anyway it's called what Chaser has... called what? Got... Chaser that's a working title. Oh, I like so it. That, that could be a chaser like orange juice next to a shot of tequila. <laughs> that could be someone running. It could oh, be a right. car chase. 
if you can like, guess what Chaser refers to, then uh, you'd be pretty fucking. You'd be on it. You'd be on the money. Oh, you know, you'd be. Uh, you'd be chasing a chasing know, a feeling. You'd know me well. Mm-hmm. Speaking of car chases, I almost feel like after watching Runner and Empty, is there a there's no car chasing old mate, is there? Uh no, there's no um like car put on car action. Put one oh my god, in. you know how expensive that shit is? I oh, know. God damn. I oh, know. Um, yeah, there's no and then speed wrap it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's always that's always looked great. I yeah, love when no. they do that. <laughs> um I've avoided car on car kind of action just thinking logistics. Um but oh, there no. is like you know, as your as the car tears away with you and Camilla Rose and Nigel is fresh out of a forklift after. Oh, yeah, that's safe. Uh, yeah, yeah, we've got we've so we've got a, yeah we've got the, the forklift uh, chasing you on foot, and then subsequently the very next scene is uh, now John on foot and you guys tearing away. Um, oh, so that would be the closest thing to probably. Yeah. There is a there is a car. Uh, you. you Two people with uh, you don't want to give too much away. No, 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 don't give it away. But you, you, know, you know, you know the scene that I'm talking about, where you're in the car with someone else, mm-hmm. um, and you get out of that situation in a creative way. Um, yeah. yeah. Or do I? Uh, mm-hmm. Or does he? I should say. Uh, you attempt to get out of the car in a creative way. Yeah, and I would say that would probably be the biggest car stunt in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, oh no! But yeah, I've tried. Well. Uh, cars and cars and guns. I've tried to avoid. Animals. Um, yep, yep, we've only got one animal. Um, is uh, no, Dean, I'm joking. Oh, I was going to throw it like it was <laughs> me. <laughs> yeah, it was too, too, too good of a joke to, to miss. <laughs> the joke was there, so I had to make it. No, there's only one animal, and it's Buddha the pug. Yeah. I do like a pug. Yeah, pugs would be pretty. Sophia's pug. Well behaved, touch wood. I think so. Yeah, there's only so much a pug can do. Can we just shove this shotgun microphone just so far down its mouth? Just to get all the, like... <laughs> just little like, snorts and shit. Yeah, just just in the background of the scene. It just, like, keeps referring I, to it. I love this idea that... Um, I love the idea that we project emotions onto animals. And so Dean's in... The character of Kit is in this, uh, you know, in the middle of a lot of things, and he realises he's making bad choices. And he's looking at the pug, and the, and the pug, you know, his name is Buddha too, so he's got this wisdom about him. Yeah. And just the, you know, the pug just sort of just kind of has a real judgment to it. Yeah, but it <laughs> is like, really, really in here, stop, right? Stop it. I <laughs> like that. It's, it's, it's kind of, it's the core shop effect. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's the, the judgment's really in here, right? The, the core like, shop I, I don't know what the fuck you're doing. I've never heard of that. What is that? So the cooler ship is an effect that um, gets used in film. Um, I can't remember fucking Alexander. I don't even know what his first name was, but it's back in like 1910 or 20 or something like that. This uh, Russian filmmaker. So the the OG Kuleshov effect. Uh, it's basically if you take a a face that's got a neutral um, pose and you juxtapose it with certain things, us as a viewer will uh, will interpret them as as will give them the feeling that we're feeling. So if you take mm. a, you, know, the, you watch the old, the original Kuleshov effect sort of like idea, and it's just a man's face, and then on either side of it, cutting in shots of food, and then he looks hungry. You cut in yeah, shots yeah, of a yeah. beautiful woman, and he looks like he's lustful. Mm. You, you know, it's mm. that idea, and it's yeah. a, it's it's an interesting one as a filmmaker and also as an actor mm. that um, that understanding that you don't need to. Ooh, all the time, but like the, the circumstances of where you are, you don't necessarily need to do too much because people will imbue upon you what um, what they think that you're feeling. And, yeah. uh, so it's like the it's the deepest essence of editing because you can't avoid doing it because you're just adding context. So you, by putting two things next to each other, there's a great example of Hitchcock showing it, and it's not neutral face, but he's smiling, but it's him. You know, seeing you know a, a child learning how to walk and smiling, and it's like, oh, it's just a real nice smile. And then it's like, you know, seeing him smiling and then cutting to like a woman, you know, in the you know on the on the grass or on the beach, you know, in a bikini. And now he's like a sus old man. Um, and it's just like same smile. You know, it's the exact yeah. same shot of him. He wasn't actually smiling at either of those two things. He was smiling at nothing. Um, but yeah, it's it's adding context, right? Because putting two shots next to each other, there's also the assumption that that person's looking at the thing, which the, it's unlikely that they are. So there's all sorts of assumptions that we make. They're probably looking at a tennis ball or a fluorescent cross on a stick. Right, John? Yeah, fucking looking at 
<laughs> Looking just right. past the camera lens or some shit. Looking at an entire crew of people. When the A-lister won't be there for the reverse, they're in their, in their fucking That's caravan. you got to, like, deliver the lines and, you know, like, maybe no one. you got to deliver the lines and look serious and you've got a grip in the background and just fucking doing one of these with his... With his crew. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's so true. And just like... <laughs> 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 see, I don't see much of this side of it. Sitting in the studio, I wish I could. Seeing more of the antics on production where you guys actually have to do it. Whereas with Mitch and I, like when we've been in the studio, it's kind of like just the two of you in the canvas. The speakers are just so honest. Mm. But to see beyond the speakers, or in other words, beyond the lens of the camera, and just the people are just being like, right. it's a carnival. It's, quite, it's just it's so foreign to me. It's quite difficult to, like, when you're in the editing process, separate all of the context of knowing what was happening, like, immediately outside the edges of the frame. And yeah. try and just be in the, like, okay, what is the blind, like, I'm just watching this for the first time, you know? Because you witness something and you go, oh, there was a shadow moving there. I know there was a person there. That's a, you know, clearly a person, that's a shadow of a crew member. Um, but then you have to go, like, watch it again. Did, you know, is it actually no that noticeable? Hmm. Would someone that wasn't in that experience, like, yeah, would they, yeah. one, notice it, two, work out what it is? Is it noticeable enough to make out? what that is or like you know the shadow of a boom just moving slightly and you go is it worth you have to make the executive decision is it worth putting this through to the vfx pipeline to get it patched up and and fixed or is it you know can we just darken it down is it actually fine as it is and trying to separate knowing what it was <clears throat> and how it just kind of externally appears that makes me realize like remember the importance of a continuity person man so that you don't oh have my to God, think yeah. about that shit. script supervisor and continuity absolutely like you, you had which your, is another there you go. I was going to say I did see a, an interesting video well, ages ago I was like um, about the importance of continuity and obviously like you, you need to have continuity and we all see like Ooh. these funny little fuck ups and what not but um, for the more minor continuity sort of errors and what not it was a uh, it was yeah just a video on, on editing and, and directing and uh, it was uh, putting more emphasis on like if you've got a shot that's got a better performance and better serve mm -hmm. you, your story and keeping keeping everything yeah. going and there's mm -hmm. a little continuity error versus a you know, slightly less one that's that's perfect always Keeps use it. that one mm -hmm. and it, it, yeah. the way that he did it was quite interesting because uh, he did a whole walking talking thing with a few cuts and whatnot. He said, yeah just talking and like but if your film is engaging and your characters are interesting and you're really wrapped up in what's happening you don't really notice uh, all the continuity errors. I'm like, yeah, that's really cool. That's really yeah, interesting. Yeah. And then, uh, then he goes, all right, we're going to watch that again, and I'm going to just show you how many different continuity errors were in the in the thing that we just that I just. So him walking, talking down the street with cuts and da 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 was just littered with continuity errors. Mm. Didn't, mm. Didn't, didn't didn't recognize a single single one, even though it was it a. It doesn't a, break that suspension yeah. of disbelief. Then I think it's okay. Hey. Yeah, Scorsese, exactly. Scorsese is very vocal on this and he goes if your story is engaging enough you yeah. don't notice and you look at any yeah. Scorsese film and the levels in cups are just jumping around up down all around like it's just yeah. absolutely crazy he just does not care in the slightest yeah. Yeah. and oh. no one's I mean very few people have known I've, I've never broke, like come out of a story of uh, you know a Scorsese movie because of the continuity ever my favourite's always the cigarette the cigarette going duh, 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 duh. Mm. yeah <laughs> That's something we have to be mindful of on old mate. Yeah. <laughs> Two of them. Two fucking cigarettes, yeah. Two hundred percent. There's actually a really funny one in Ace Ventura that is so obvious once you see it, but it's a full chessboard. And then literally two shots later there is not a single piece That's on nice. that chessboard. <laughs> wow. and it was just one of those one of those movies you see it. It's in the second one when nature calls. Mm. And he's just sitting there in, the, in that place full of animals and everything mm. and and I just I saw it on a movie thing. Just like it was just like ten most continuity error, er, yeah, things like that. You know, ten mm -hmm. best versions of it. Mm -hmm. And I just remember seeing it and going, you know, that's amazing. Now that you've pointed it out, but I never, I never distracted me. Didn't notice. Mm -hmm. And I think that is the trick. Like, yeah, you get shown it afterwards. You know, like, okay, the illusion is broken, but I'm still staring at what I need to stare at when I watch it. Like, I'm not. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's, there's, it's a fine line though. There's one egregious one that um, that I was this is years and years ago, and for some reason it's just stuck in my mind. You know, they have those weird memories from 15 years ago. They're like, why am I <laughs> onto you and not more important things? But, <laughs> um, 
watching <laughs> watching Back to the Rafters and Michaela Michaela Benas. Is that how you say her last name? Anyway, sure. lovely, lovely actress. And she's there's this really intense scene with her and this other guy. And she's wearing this bright green top that kind of... It's one of these ones that comes... like It sort of hangs off the shoulder. And um, they've had two... They've had a couple of different... Two takes. Oh, yeah. One's on the shoulder. One's it's off the, worst. the shoulder. One's on the oh, shoulder. And they yeah, just... Man, they use... I'm like, man, you are not... You, you're using like the... You're, they're just going oh. from... I'm just watching it just, just going... Shoulder, off shoulder. Shoulder, off shoulder. Shoulder, off Fuck shoulder. Fuck, man. Been there. That's My favorite when you know you something do. is when you know something is real. Like I'm sure you guys have seen this online, perhaps when Aragorn kicks the head in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> oh, and breaks his. You know, in the scene, it's like, and I've always say, you always turn around, and you know, he broke his. My missus just like, shut up, like you just like, <laughs> let the scene play out, and I can't do it. It's like I need to give the information again, and and then or if I don't, might have forgotten. Yeah, yeah, if I don't, yeah. she'll do it. It's just, like, you know that that, I'm like, and we'll wait a whole movie as well. Just, you know that Aragorn hurt himself and that. I don't know, it's just, I don't know, it's just, you just I don't next know why. Time, next time you watch, you just got to walk out of the room for that scene. Yeah. <laughs> Can't do it. Just take just yourself can't. out of the situation, you know? My, my yeah. version of that one is uh, Ocean's Eleven, where George Clooney and Brad Pitt were playing pranks on each other the entire time, and they got like very rogue. I think George Clooney, it, it culminated in him taking a shit in his cat's litter box. Um, <laughs> really got out of control. Yeah, look into this. It's crazy um, what those two were doing to each other. Um, but in the scene where George Clooney gets out of jail and Brad Pitt's waiting for him, there's just the running joke that Brad Pitt has to eat food in every movie that he's in. And so he's eating this sandwich and they packed it with just the hottest hot sauce they could find. And so the, the take that they used on screen was the one where he took a bite and then realised what they'd done. And he holds character fine, but you can see all that process in his head when you know. <laughs> you see him take a bite and just go, oh, fuck, they got me. <laughs> I always did think there was a lot of detail to that for no reason. I do remember seeing that now. Oh, I like Is it the first, the first Ocean's Eleven movie? Yeah. Also <laughs> found that um, Marlon Brando, Brando, he's always doing something with his hands and He's like tearing labels off things. He's like playing with gloves. He's like flicking stuff. But he's always like physically grounding himself and stuff. Mm. There's something I learned a, uh, a directing technique where if you need someone to be a little bit distracted, um, putting a putting a rock or something. Ideally, when you're sitting down, it would be horrible if you have to stand on it. But yeah, putting a little putting a little pebble in your shoe in yeah. the actor's shoe rather. Mm. There are some times if I have a tense scene... Getting a little just something you can't... I'm busting to go to the toilet and the scene's tense. I won't go to the toilet. There you go. That's hilarious. Yeah, right. Yeah, it's weird, man. So next movie that Mitch does and he's got his cast out and someone's like, oh, hey, mate, you work with Mitch Charman. Like, what was that like? I'm like, fuck, mate. Kept putting rocks in my fucking shoes. Didn't let me piss. I realised... Yeah, I I did it once and then I realised that, like, you definitely want to exhaust all your other... (laughs) <laughs> you definitely want to use all the other tools in your toolkit first. That's like a yeah. the actor has, sort of thing. The actor has no idea what you're doing. They're just like, what? I can't give a fucking rocks my shit. <laughs> We're indoors. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I can, I can, I get the vibe that you wouldn't be putting up with much of that, John. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd throw it at you. <laughs> almost, I almost want to see what happens. I would, I would do it, yeah. Mitch. I want, I want you to do it, Mitch, so I can see what happens to you. <laughs> I felt like uh, I definitely felt like it would be great for like uh, I don't know someone who's meant to be in a mental asylum and you're not really sure if they're crazy or not and just having some little distracting thing that they can't quite and you don't know where it's coming from obviously you can't see their shoe so they just sort of have this quality about them and they just seem agitated for no reason. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty funny actually. I like that idea. What are some of the other uh, Reddit questions? Um, got another one. Uh, Before we do that, can I just run mm, real quick? Absolutely. Big Terry will take your place. He will stand in. I was waiting for another gaffer. Coin slot. Can you do any of the Predator soundtrack with that? Oh. <laughs> it's pretty. It's all very percussive, isn't it? Yes. 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 
It's actually a really do, there was famous composer, isn't he? And now Dean. He's a really the, uh, famous composer, right? The guy that did the Predator sound. Oh, uh, Alan right. Silvestri. Alan Silvestri's sick. Yeah, he's um, a... Also, the, the director of it, um... Remind me? Pardon? Oh, the McTien- McTiernan. Um, it's McTiernan. I can't think of his uh, first name. But he uh, also the directed the first... The he, he also directed yeah. the John first... John McTiernan, yeah. He also uh, directed yeah. the first Die Hard, and they're two of my favourite movies. There you go. Yeah. Just the guy. With the man. Yeah. Um, Mason did some great... Um, Flute for the Predator theme. Can you do the percussion, Dean? Me? Yeah, stitch them together. Yeah. No, no, what? just, just do it because it'd be a great intro for this video. Oh, no, I can't, man. <laughs> yeah, you did it, you did it the, other, the other week. Did I? No, I can't think of the percussion. Or maybe it was a John. Yeah, all I know is that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that is. I'll make it in there as well. That's all good. <laughs> I'll also good. make it in. And we'll get, when John comes back, he'll do the. Uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, <laughs> So a bit of a, it's funny that sound the the like the extended techniques. There was there was this time in uni where we were doing this this uh, this performance. It was eighteen musicians and we were in an art gallery, and we were doing this very avant garde performance where there were microphones on all our instruments, um, and oh, and it oh. and it was running through like algorithmic um, oscillators and and weird. Good Lord. Yeah, it was. Anyways, you weren't al- you weren't allowed to really play the instrument the way, it's or at least what everyone else was doing. Yeah, so there was, and I I just couldn't quite figure it out at the time. I just thought this is so silly. Uh, it's kind of like radio is guitar playing. <laughs> literally, um, but somehow in it is a texture that, if you can find it, and if it suits well for what it is, like that sound of the you know the. Mm. Like, which is just not mm. playing it correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds so unique. I love all that mm. stuff. I love all the texture. I mean, oh. we've done so much texture for this. I love, um, I suppose, the bass line for me is um, Strawberry Fields Forever, the Beatles song, mm. where they just, like, were putting microphones in weird places on the instruments. Yeah. yeah. Love it. But it could have could have gone horribly, horribly wrong. Mm-hmm. I think the beauty of it was just, like, sometimes I find you just, you go, you find the sound eventually, but... You would never have found out unless you went through mm-hmm. this weird process. And that's what I was, I guess, trying to say before about some ideas just... You have to go through mm. through it before it appears. You have to be taken on the journey of... And it's kind of what you said before, John, as well, about how your idea might start out like this. And actually, as you're going through it, you're like, no, it would be so much better if it was in this light or in this way. Um... And you just wouldn't have come up with that way unless you started with the source idea that was and could have been incorrect. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, you touched on right there with the word correct. We're in the arts. It's like, that's probably the hardest part and the reason so many oh. of these mental struggles come into it is because there isn't a correct. There isn't a right and a wrong. There's an in- infinite degree, you know, there's a, there's a <laughs> infinitesimal spectrum of, of different, different choices and people have taste. Yeah. Yeah. I do different. like pretending there is a correct and then mm. getting there and then being the opposite one to go, but what if it wasn't? But mm. the idea of the correct is essentially a form of boundary to allow you to just get it there and then when you're there, you can ask the question, wait, is this even right? We've done this plenty of times, Mitch. You know, mm-hmm. Is this even right for this? Especially on the the you know in in the in, in old mate where you know the corkscrew does its thing um the amount of different things that we went through for the music in that scene for the mm. the lead up to that scene and and then to kind of have the idea of the guitar string just bah! like just to completely mm. let go and it was so tight it was so lively it was so strong and and that idea was just so out of nowhere when we were doing mm-hmm. it, it was such yeah. an experimental thing, but mm-hmm. it, it but, but then it had meaning to the idea of like he's no longer, you know, it's no longer stable, no longer structured, no longer mm-hmm. normal. It's chaos. It's 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 it's, bit, it's disgust. It's you know, and you know you can't really get that idea if you're like let's find that 
you know, if from the onset, half, half mm-hmm. of who's making the errors... Was, was, yeah, we didn't even know what we were looking for. So to know what you're yeah. looking for is half the bloody battle. Uh, it's part, half the fun. It's all the fun, really. It's yeah. part of the fun. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. You reminded me when of... it pays off. <laughs> you reminded me a little bit of one of my favourite bit of directions that I've ever got, which was also incredibly savage, was uh, we're doing this... <laughs> doing this Bulgarian play at, at school and we had this Russian director come over from St. Petersburg. It was a fucking animal. But um, I was playing this uh, this Russian priest. And I'd gone to like uh, Russian Orthodox services and, you know, had worked on it and uh, just up there, we're doing the scene, whatever, finishes up and he's like, John, you got a choice. The choice was correct. And uh, I said, oh, I'm glad you liked it. Just because it was correct does not mean it was good. Oh, oh, and I was, oh, in that I moment, like I was just like, oh, fuck, shit. <laughs> but it's just like, that stuck with me in a way that just like, and yeah, I, wow. I, 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 I do this myself when I'm about to say it's but too often like focusing on what is the correct way to play this scene or what is the, what is exactly what it's meant to be. But what you need to be looking for is, uh, is what's your own individual take on it? What's something interesting about it? What's what's going to be yeah. good, good to watch as opposed to what is correct? What is right? Yeah, yeah. Like interesting that. always always yeah. takes precedence. That's going to stick to, with me. Yeah. I need to check that my phone's charging. Sorry, boys. Do you yeah. find that, Mitch? With um, I definitely do that when it comes to recording, playing, especially when I'm working or producing with other people. You play the part that they desire, the part that the song's asking for. But then there's, and once you've got that take, to use the same word, I guess, Mm -hmm. um, you have this experiment of like, well, now that we've got that, the safe option or the the good option, or what if we just tried it again uh, and just break a few of the rules? Definitely. Minimum minimum three three versions, always. So you do the way that you intended it. So, okay, so I suppose the two different fields, one is directing. And then one is like visual effects or art in general. Anyone that's like commissioned something of me to create. So I suppose I have a finished thing to then present. Um, so talking about that one briefly, I always present three versions. So version one is exactly what they've asked for to the letter as best as I can, taking their vision and making what I think they want. Second version is always a variation of that because in between that, I always try and push it far away as well. So between the two, they're going to say, you know, some, some version of A, some version of B. And then I'll do a, a, a version C, which is where I just go absolutely rogue and just go, this is what I actually want to see. I'm going to all but ignore, you know, 90% of what you've said, taking only what I need. You know, so if it's a title sequence for a, a series, right, you know, have the actual lockup, obviously, have the resolve where it achieves the purpose. But just the way we get there, I just go, all right, let's try it. Let's just go like 180. Let's go over there. Let's try it. Something completely different. And I would, I would probably say 60% of the time, option C gets tabled as let's include some, let's pepper in yeah. some elements from it. We'll, we'll talk- rarely go yeah. with the version 3, but it usually be a version 4 or 5 that then... It has it. Has yeah, which is... So, yeah. We've spoken um, about this before, Mitch, and I think there's something about it, especially when you're doing client work mm. um, with, with, with companies and stuff that are kind of unsure. It teaches you a lot about, what, about them. You know, one of the ideas I like to run with is, like you said, write down the barrel what they desire. But I always try and include one that I definitely think is the one I would do. The one it's I the one prefer. that you would want to see. The one that you Absolutely. would want to hear. And um, and usually, if they can, some people can actually say, like, I no, I there's something about that one. Mm. And most of the time, they do lean towards that. When they don't, the the beauty of it is, it's kind of like they knew what they wanted all along. So it's not a bad thing. It's kind of mm. like they knew that that's what they wanted and you got it for them and they were totally happy with it. When a producer or a director knows what they want, that's like the best case scenario because <laughs> you could actually, they, they can articulate it and then you can <clears throat> receive that and do it. What I find overwhelmingly most of the time is that people don't know what they want, but they right. know very well what they don't want, but they right. only know that <laughs> after they've seen it. Yes. So you just have to go through this journey of, <laughs> oh, oh, you realize you don't like this either. Okay, okay. Oh, you realize you don't like this either. Oh, you realize that <laughs> we end up in this full circle, end up back where we started. You just had to eliminate all other possible opportunities first. I had a weird one the other day. I think I spoke to you about this, Mitch. I was asked to write 
a specific style, and the style was this meditative, very gentle kind of music for a tourism campaign. And mm-hmm. I was like, and they had references to ones they'd already done that were similar, and I just knew <clears throat> it was not right whatsoever. Mm. But I did it anyways. But I accidentally, and I did <laughs> do this by mistake. Okay. I accidentally, oh, all right. I accidentally set them a six other tracks I did for another client. Just six completely, completely different tracks. Um, And they didn't question it, even though it was clearly had a tractor video attached with it. (laughs) They just (laughs) bypassed that and just, just started making notes. We like number one. Number two is a bit strange. Number three could work. And I was like, Number four, do we, was that our tractor? Yeah, none of these were even the same genre at oh, well. all. We're talking yeah. Foo Fighters style <laughs> tunes or folk oh. tunes or electronic. <laughs> Nowhere near meditation. And it just goes to show that in that experiment, a lot, I learned a lot about it. There was something, it was something interesting. And they ended up choosing one of the tracks that the other client didn't like, which was hilarious to me because it's like yeah. that somehow lived on um but it was just beautiful I mistake like where um it was there's we wouldn't have gotten there once again mm. if if we did if the error wasn't there if, mm. and it just goes going the direction that, that we were pointed with the direction of the director then, we wouldn't have I, ended yeah, up with the yeah. best outcome and then i sent them the track i actually wrote mm-hmm. in the style they wanted and they dismissed it in literally now nah, we don't like that yeah, wow. And I was like, so you really didn't know. And I knew. I knew their first idea was wrong. Mm-hmm. I just knew it. Mm. But they didn't, perhaps. They totally. needed this weird mm. experiment, in this case, to, to, to determine. We actually like that. I'm like, They're my favorite clients where they actually come to you for your mind, not just your hand. Absolutely. And they actually genuinely care about yeah. your perspective on the thing yeah. that you've spent your life doing. As opposed and, they, to... and it was a great ending to the whole thing. Like it was yeah. like, and it was crunch time. We had 24 hours. <laughs> so it was right to the wire. Could have been an absolute failure. Um, mm. But I realized had it not gone wrong, ooh, it would have been a tough time. Because I would mm. have sent them the thing they wanted and they would have been like, mm. But do you think they still would have arrived at not liking that one if they hadn't heard any alternatives yeah I do because I think because they hadn't seen the visuals they hadn't seen you know like when we see the back end of it or we we see it put together you just get your gut feeling you're like Mm. nah but they haven't they haven't seen the actual visuals or anything yet so in my opinion I was like oh this is not the right direction but hey in the end it it worked out fantastic happy accident a lot of people in those positions that make the final call on those things it's unfortunate, but the kind of people that have a great skill set for that aren't, I mean, sometimes don't have the most artistic tastes. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like they're real number people, like the real wired kind of control freaks. And so they want to control all the things and they've seen something on Netflix and they really like the thing. So it's like, just do this, but different, like just make it just different enough so we can use it, but like do exactly this, but not that. Um, and you just go like, ah, but bring some, bring something new to it, you know? Like- you're paying for it. Like, let's let's make let's make it up. I think approaching different takes as an actor, it's good to take a leaf out of this book as well, and not just to yeah. what you what you. I think you're reading how it should be, and to experiment with it. So That's very much why I like you and John, for the roles that I've got you as and, and as actors in general, um, because you take risks, you are willing to make it up on the spot something that you haven't prepared for. Some people get really anxious with that and anxiety can express itself with frustration and and other things. So you kind of have to mitigate a relationship. Um, But you guys are just like, yeah, fucking let's give it a go, you know? And then mm, I I, I would say, I would say nine out of 10 times I've gone with your, your guys version of the take. Oh yeah. I read the script and I was just like, I'll fuck you. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I like that. John and I how called each other. Had, how long well, did you have that prepared, John? Just sit there. <laughs> a script is sitting right here, and I took I saw the moment and took it. I don't have the latest right. stuff. It's too good. Don't, don't worry, John will throw it at you. 
John Clue doesn't reason, want it. <laughs> for some reason, my phone keeps going, oh, your battery's low, but it's been plugged in the entire time. Anybody yeah, my phone's doing a similar thing here. Is it? We lost you there. It's, oh, we've just lost it. No, he's still there. It says charging, but it's mm-hmm. like getting lower and lower. I think it's because you're like streaming and uploading all at the same time. Yeah, can right. you just, while, while you're in this current off mode, can you just like double click on your home button and get rid of any other pages you've got open? Because that'll all be <laughs> I mean, using data and using um, battery. Pretty much all gone now. I think it's crossed. Yeah. Let me know if it starts to wind down. Oi! Alright, show and tell, show and tell. Dane, show us your shit. I already did it, didn't I? Do the line, uh, do the line jump. Solo, is it? You did the line jump? I, I yeah. just realised it was too You very son of a bitch. Arms. Looks like the CIA is good to pushing too many pencils. <laughs> I can't remember what he said. <laughs> right on cue. Right on cue. Alright, John, show and tell. Big Terry, run us through. One... One championship. So that's a Southeast Asian uh, mixed martial arts and Muay Thai and fucking you know, awesome. multi-faceted uh, organized fighting organization. And this is uh, when I was in uh, Thailand oh, six or seven years ago. And uh, one was putting on a, a show in Bangkok. And we're just like, yes, yeah, got to go fucking watch it. And uh, yeah, so we went and watched some fights with uh, me and my mate, my mate's dad and a bloke. <laughs> One of the scariest dudes, this giant guy called Yuri. There's this fucking uh, Russian guy that that my, that uh, Iggy worked with, who was like, "Oh yeah, so he used to be a boxer." And it's like, "Yeah, so yeah, we're going to watch the fights." And Yuri got fucking pissed drunk at this event and started picking fights with people in front of him. And he genuinely wanted to fight these these guys who were sitting in front of us. And we're just like, "Yuri, like fucking." Calm the fuck down. I've never met this guy in my goddamn life. He's this giant, bald Russian dude. And, um, yeah, that was a hell of a night. But, Man, when, yeah, you, when, of, when you say a guy's giant, like, I'm like, like holy fuck. fuck. He must be big. <laughs> <laughs> He's a big, big, scary Russian. But, um, yeah, one championship. It's a, uh, yeah, good organization. Mm. Well, see, okay. I'm wearing John and Dean. <laughs> it's weird that the two of you like are next to each other on the screen ah! and then uh... I love it nice I'm also the only one out of the three of us that doesn't have a t-shirt as well oh yes indeed yes he is, he is like reminding me about that we're on it we're on the case get on there I'll wear it to every gig man hundreds of people will see it a week and I'll be like hey yeah what well, yeah, no. Remember, we are. Uh, we've got the. We got the strategy when we get closer to. to I'll wear it release. on stage for sure. I'd wear it on stage at the gigs on the. It weekend. needs to be all the time. Oh fuck yeah. it. it. You reckon? Yeah, like from now. From now, man. I'll be like, watch the podcast every week, like this thing, like, and I'll, I'll yeah. do a QR code on my little QR. When are you? Code. When are you down in Sydney next? Because I've got all the QR code things. It could be. Okay. And I got your script. It could be. Could be this Friday. Could be the. I've got all the stuff to give to you, man. Could be this Friday or right. Friday after. Let me know, bro, because I've got all this stuff here. You keep asking, where is it? It's right oh, there. Well. Definitely want an old mate shirt like the one you've got, Mitch, I think, for sure. I yeah, I need, to, need to get more of these. Did I send... Because I know also, that if I just wear that on stage... I'll also give you back the, the ones that don't fit me. Oh, the other ones. Yeah. yeah, didn't you already give them to me? Didn't you give them to uh, me? Maybe stuff? I did. I think you did. Maybe you weren't. Um, uh, this is, I think this is the, the OG. This is the one I was wearing. On the, on the first set day. Did you just flex your guns as you did that, Mitch? I think you Let's did. see. Just wearing this uh, old mate shirt, so, you know. There was a little bit of flex. Let's see it again. <laughs> Dude puts the glasses on. Let's see it again. Want to see the shirt again? I want to see the flex. Um, yeah. I want to see the flex again. <laughs> oh, fucking my... my <laughs> flex. Come on, my per- personal assistance here. Come on, Mitch. You're, yeah, okay. I <laughs> can... Get, get, get the, the lighting right. What's the guy got to do for the library card? Hey! Hey! There you go. What's the guy got to do for the library card? Library card. That's bad. But uh, no, so sorry, John. Um, show and tell though. Uh, Big Terry, mate. Give us oh, the give us yeah. give us that story. I'm sure people are going to want to know what's going on here. There's a John behind John. What's do we on? have a? Oh. He's fucking oh, lifestyle. Awesome. Terry. He is. Five, six five, Big Terry. That's right. 
So, as our uh, lovely viewers may not know, um, no, I just do a bunch of Canadian club commercials and I have a recurring character, which is, oh my God, I'm the luckiest, luckiest guy going around. But um, yeah, Big Terry in the Canadian club commercials. And that came about because uh, Canadian club were having a Christmas party. And I you know, got invited to it and I brought the agent along and I walk in and immediately see <laughs> a fucking cut out of myself. I'm just kind of like, can I, uh, <laughs> can I have... Can yeah, I have like, me? Yeah, yeah, sweet. Let us know. Not and, in a Jeffrey uh, Dahmer kind of way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, they, they sent sent me one to my work. And so this big package shows up with a case of Canadian Club. And the guy's like, what's that? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and open it up. And so now I have That's the art. Awesome. Myself, and I was saying before, it's really useful for self self tests for uh, uh, getting the focus. Yeah, yeah that's great. Literally got my own stand in. <laughs> yeah, bring it, bring it to set. That'd be awesome. <laughs> I want to do the DJ booth. We're hanging out here with Big, Big Terry. <laughs> get some songs written. You should get you a song going on. I want to know how often you get recognised, uh, with Big Terry. Every now, and, every every now and again, people are like, "Are you Big Terry? Mm. Is that Big Terry from Big Terry? Mm-hmm. No, no, I love. I, I don't love like beer anymore. I love my fans. You actually, but, like um, no, I. I yeah, every now and, and again. How do you drink it then? Nice. Big a, Terry drinks it. <laughs> there's Are a pub, there's a pub down the road where they uh, the the people behind the bar. Yeah, I always go there and watch the flights. The Moor Park View, good pub, good down there. Hey, um, good pub. MPV. But uh, I'll go down there to do a bit of work or watch the flights, and uh, that's another thing about getting out of your space. It's like I find do my best book work having a beer at the pub. But um, absolutely, yeah, people behind the bar there. I've been there, you know. Like, 20 odd times and then they're just like we just have to ask are you the guy from the Canadian club ad and just yeah fuck him. but yeah you know, when it. I'm working the doors sometimes when I'm working the, working the doors sometimes you get drunk cuts coming out just being like blah, 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 blah. <laughs> my favourite bloke was a Garbo who used to uh, come and uh, pick up the rubbish at at uh, Coogee Bay lovely guy I can't remember his name but um Remember, he called me Big Tezza all the time. Big Tezza. <laughs> and then one, one day, so it just says, Hey, is your name actually Terry? <laughs> <laughs> nah. <laughs> oh, shattered his world. Um, no, nah, yeah. You mean characters aren't real? <laughs> <laughs> I, lo- I, love, I love Big Terry. I love his legacy. I love that Canadian club let us keep the mullet for old mate. Yeah, oh, thank you, Canadian yeah, club. Thank you, Canadian, CC. Matt, thank you so much, all the lovely people at CC. And um, yeah, they I mentioned it to them. That's like, oh, look, I'll probably have a mullet. It was like pitching it. <laughs> mullets are in these days. This is for the last one. They're, you know, they're like, yeah, look, mullets are in these days. It's sort of fitting of the character. And they're just like, yeah, all right, okay, all right. <laughs> yeah, I love it. Um, I jokingly said to one of the ladies while we we're on set, one of the, you know, one of the people, the monkeys, I was just like, Oh, next for the next ad, it's going to be fucking down here. It's just, no. <laughs> yeah. it, like, no, we're not having that. <laughs> All right, we'll need to, we'll need to sneak, sneak in the old mate shoots before you have your next CC, Jazz. That's it. Are you, are you allowed to say, are you allowed to say how long you're contracted for? Is it a year by year basis or something? Oh, it's a year, year by year basis. So basically, most of, most of them, um, are either a 12 month or a 6 month contract but yeah. this is what when people always ask oh you, you did one or two days on set and then, or a week yeah. and they're just like oh you get paid that amount for, for that short amount of time it's like they're not for commercial ads they're not paying for as the much time, as you yeah. work on the day not paying, not paying for your day rate right, yeah and uh, so those ads were all like a 6 or 12 month usage yeah. but with a lot of op- optional extras yeah. so you're getting paid like, oh, do you want to, do want to take it overseas? Do you want to go to New Zealand? All these options that they've Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And it's also because it completely wipes you out of the alcohol market. I was just well, about after to five say, years. Yeah. Mm. Oh, 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 I won't get another alcohol job for a, for a long, long time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. That's all right because I'm incredibly thankful that I got that series of ads. Great, uh, it's great. Lucrative. I think it's up there with. Um, the, the bud- I think it's up there with Katut and. Um, and those guys. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I wouldn't put myself up with Couture. He's the fucking man. I don't know. I think you got him covered. 
Like a sunrise. Yeah, right. Like a sunrise. Laura Bingo, where the bloody hell are you? <laughs> <laughs> that was a long time ago. Bloody hell. Any more uh, Reddit? Solid campaigns. Any more Not... Reddit questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, we have got another one. Um, this one is a bit more... Um... Oh, just, just very quickly... This Straightforward, yo. Step back so you can cut it back into the conversation. Yeah, yeah. Before, but oh, I was thinking about mm. it while everyone was talking. But um, when you talk about clients um, wanting these strangely derivative ideas, this is a really extreme example, but it's fucking funny. Um, one of one of the one of the big fast food ones. I'm not going to say which, but um, was doing oh, a shoot yes. for him, and we're doing the the hero shots, so the shot where you. And there's a very specific way of doing these. Uh, so when you eat the burger. You just eat the burger. You've got to lift it up. You've got to look at it. You've got to think about how delicious it's going to be. Then you take the bite. Mm. Oh, guys, make it. Yeah. And then think about how delicious it was. But um, so we're doing that the hero shot of like eating the burger. And we do a couple of takes, and the director's like, "Yeah, sweet, no worries." Goes off and talks to the client for a bit. Then comes back and he's just like, "I've got a what? I, I've got what I want." But. The client wants you to. Um, yeah, what do you say? You say the client said, "Remember that ad from last year?" And the guy who did the bite, he did it perfectly. So if you could just do it like that. Oh, okay. Do we have? Do we have a reference? No. <laughs> and I'm just. And he's. I was just like, I. What? I. I, I didn't. I don't know what that ad is. But yeah, so he's just like, yeah, well, I man. what I want. If you can please just do it exactly as the way the guy did it last year, even though you haven't seen the ad. That'd be fucking great. Yeah, I did a car commercial. It reminds me of a, to start with that. It reminds me. Sorry, Mason. It reminds me of a car commercial I did, and there was like the biggest discussion about the length of my stubble. Should it be a millimeter shorter than this? And like three different people come over and look at the guy like. Um, and they like go off and talk about it. Like, fucking hell. The attention to detail in advertising is out of control. I was doing this, and again, I won't, yeah, won't say the, the company name, but it's a very large Australian uh, communication company. Mm. And they have a very um, famous way the logo comes in. And it's very particular in Australia. Mm-hmm. And uh, I actually, I made it. And it does, this, it does this little bit of a spin. And I did it over four frames. So we... Broadcast TV in Australia, 25 frames a second. So it's like 20% of a, of a second, you know, whatever that is. It's a fraction of a second. Mm. And I had this thing doing this, doing this spin, and the client comes in, this advertising, you know, advertising agency, so he's got, he's got the scarf, and, you know, when a client is coming in, Sam Pellegrino waters are out, the cheese boards are out. <laughs> I'm you not know, laughing. Everyone's drinking Sam <laughs> Pellegrino waters out of fucking champagne glasses. You know, this is, this is the, the fine world of advertising, right? And, uh, and the client... <coughs> comes down next to the computer and he goes play it again play it again yeah play it one more time yeah can you make it uh one frame faster so we're talking one twenty-fifth of a second difference and play it again play it again <laughs> no i like it we had it and walks away uh, <laughs> oh you're fucking kidding me <laughs> well, there's a lot of um i have to intervene in this moment for this ridiculous thing because it justifies my entire job yeah. <laughs> right. I think so. I think sometimes yeah. there's some people that just they feel like they want to say or have an input, and you know it's like what? Because mm-hmm. otherwise they would have a genuine reason for why. Mitch and I have spoken about this mm-hmm. before. It's like there's a reason why you would if if tell me what it is. <laughs> they don't have an explanation. You're just like you're just full of shit. Yes. Like what? Uh, it's so frustrating. That's <laughs> so frustrating. But I'm happy to do your ads, wherever the fuck you are. Oh, oh yeah, like, <laughs> don't get us wrong. We're getting paid for this. Oh, I love it. We're not complaining. I love how we're, Hire us. I love how we're, we're all jumpy. We're just going to go home at... on a podcast and tell people about how shit you are. I love how we're all jumpy. Like, no, 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 no. I was, I was going to jump in and just say, like, look, you know, while there are those people out there, you love when you're on set and there's, like, so many good clients out there that you see them sitting in the tent. And um, then you sort of watch them to see what the reaction when they ever talk. They watch them the playback and they're like, yeah, just yeah, keep, yeah, that <laughs> happens keep too. Doing that. Yeah, just keep doing that. Like, great. Right. Yeah, yeah, that okay. happens. You guys do. That happened on a. You are right, Mitch. That happened on like right a, when they say sorry, did? No, you go. 
you're right when they say, um, oh no, I've lost my train of thought. When you, when they, no, nah, it's gone. I did a paint commercial and they, they loved something I accidentally did. Like a couple of, there's a couple of painters that, that were like doing a little kind of comedy skit every time there was a paint commercial and I was like a ring in. And they pulled up at this job site and apparently I'm a fuck up painter and like, you're yeah, taking the piss out of what I do. And they're like, oh, you're really going to use that paint? And I'm like, yeah, it's extra on the weather. And I like stuck my finger up like that. Like, they're pissing the clients. They're pissing themselves going, it looks like you fingered them up. Like, but not. Like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, meant to do it. <laughs> no, I didn't. It was an accident. Dulux, get it in ya. It wasn't Dulux, but hey. <laughs> <laughs> and then a bird shat on the wall. No, uh, that was the. Uh, oh no! Oh, it's the end of the ad. Continuity. I fucking love it. <laughs> Wait, no, do you mean the bird in the ab- ad shat on the wall, or like that. on set? I don't. No, no, it was like part of the ad. It was meant to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh. What paint ad is this? <laughs> I'm <laughs> I'm <laughs> the amount of ads around has so uh, many. The amount of money that gets pumped into all of them, it's crazy. Um, I'm happy to we're see. actually, we've done a... There you go. Uh, pardon me. There you go. Yeah. I was gonna, I was going to steer the conversation, so one, one last note on that. Please do. Um, we are running at almost an hour 20, which means we've almost hit our hour and a half, mm-hmm. which means we don't have time for uh, the other questions. We can save them for later, uh-huh. but we do have the important question, Old Mates of the Week. There were a couple of dudes and like not physically but in energy, they were at my gig. I don't remember what night it was, but the their energy reminded me of um Wayne's World. So I felt like Garth and <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know, like they put, seemed like an odd couple that are fucking hilarious. And they sort of were, they were pretty hilarious, I gotta say. And I yeah. met them on the break and they were giving me um nice feedback and stuff. And I asked them what they did for a living and one of them said I can't remember what his real job was, but he's like, yeah, I started an OnlyFans. He's like, why the fuck should women just make money out of it? Like, you can make a fortune. He's like, I can do it. You Maybe you should do it. I'm like, no, I don't, I don't think so. But uh, I've, oh, gone, uh, I've gone, how much do you make? He's gone, $19.95. <laughs> and that's why guys don't do OnlyFans. Yeah, I'm like, I don't think it's only been a week, but still. Yeah. If I'm jerking off on camera, like I want more than twenty bucks. <laughs> 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 if I can't go out and buy a chicken roll from Chargo Charlie's. Yeah, fuck it, it's, it's worth, worth it. it. Like, hey, my face is in a video of me pleasuring myself. Like, yeah. Yeah. Just do feet videos. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, feet videos. Oh mate, your Toronto your Toronto mate will will have a ball. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's my old mate of the week. I have a weird old mate. I have a weird old mate. It's, yeah, yeah. I don't know. It's very, it's just interesting little old mate. It's actually an old woman, really, in this one. But she was in the crowd at the gig, and I was still feeling fairly unwell on Saturday night. But I was like, you know what? I'll get through it. And I was having a little fun, getting into it. And she just walks up to the front of the stage and holds up her phone to me. And it just has written in the text, Give me a reason. And then she looks at me all like sad. And I'm still playing. I think we're in the middle of sex is on fire. Sex on fire. And we're like playing along. And I'm like, I see she wants to talk to me because they think we're not at the office. Or, you know, I'm in the middle of a song. But, you know, this is the perfect time yeah. to speak to the musician. Yes, it is. But sometimes I'll take, if, if someone's genuinely got a request or something. or And it's easy enough for them to tell her. I'll quickly read or I'll quickly have a listen. Yeah. And I and keep going, you know. So I'm... I'm She's like, yeah. I'm like, give me a reason. What? And she's, <laughs> I have no idea. And then she's like, huh. so I just retreat back to my job, playing bass in this song, like waiting for this girl to explain herself. And then she goes, my husband died last week. Oh. And I was like, what? And I couldn't, and she just goes, and I'm like. What do you want from me? This is 1 a.m. in the morning yeah. at this point. Mm. It's a crowd full of people. She just decides that she she needs to tell me. Um, so I'm like, okay, whatever. And then I'm like, what do you, what do you, 
your husband died. She goes, my husband died. Give me a reason. And I was like, a reason for what? Like, what do you want me to do here? I have no idea what you want me to do. And then she was just trying to say, play, give me a reason, the song. Yeah. I, think, I knew. I knew. I knew that was coming. And, like, and she didn't say that part. No, no. She didn't say, can you play that? Yeah. She just looked at me with disgust. My husband died last week. Give me a reason. Like, I'm like, what, a reason to live? What do you want me to do? I've got nothing here. Nine ears in. I take him out. And I was like, what do you want? And I literally said in the microphone afterwards, because she just got upset like huh, and then walked off and then I said after the song finished because the band were curious as to what the hell was going on and I just get into the microphone and I'm like you know when you walk into Maccas and you demand them to play oh, sorry sorry you walk into Maccas and you demand <laughs> them to give you a Subway sandwich like and you know it's just I cannot give you what I do not have like to this lady and she was just hell upset walking off oh. and we start another tune and then she just starts dancing. Yes. And I'm just like, what? what? Yes. Your husband died. You're upset we didn't play a song. And now you're happy. This sounds what? like my life, what, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was just one hell of an interesting observation. Yeah, that's hilarious. And that was, she's an old man. I don't know if she just made it all up. If she made the husband thing up just so that I could play the tune for her. Um, it's the Porter's Head one, I right? don't know what angle, or if she genuinely lost her husband a week ago, why is she at the Mustang bar at 1am and continue partying? There were so many things I needed to ask this lady, but I was at the, you know, had to keep playing. I was like, I wanted to know, I was like, what is happening in your corner of the world right now? Oh, yeah, man. So I didn't, didn't play the, the song she wanted. The song give, give Me a Reason. Is she talking about the Tracy Chapman Give Me One Reason? Or is it Port... No, oh, it Port- was Port- 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 What's no, Give Me a Reason? Give Me a Reason. I think it's... Be you know, a woman. Maybe. I think it's Portishead. Oh, maybe it is Tracy Chapman. Give me one reason. Oh, yeah, give me one reason to say it. Yeah, it could be. Turn that back around. It's like... A- Maybe it's her favourite song. With when, her you, when you said she wanted me to play the song, I was like, did she even fucking spell the song? No. Right. Oh, they no, never do, man. Give me a reason. Nah, it was pretty, but that's why I was confused. I was like, she could have said, play, give me a reason, or yeah. play, or, yeah, yeah. or do, like, the give song. me an action. She just said, give me a reason, and I'm like, to do what? To do what? Give me, there was no context. Give me a reason. Perfect example of the cooler shop effect. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I constantly have people so hold out their phone with their Spotify open. I need these fucking, oh. I need these to see. I'm like, I can't fucking see it. Yeah. <laughs> Ask me What's the... your most common request? What do they get? What do they ask? Um, well, in Newcastle, it tends to be horses. Daryl Braithwaite. Oh, yep. That's <laughs> All right, eh? Uh, we have these two is, is... guys every week. They rock up and they always ask for Tracy Chapman. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, not Tracy Chapman. Sorry, not Tracy Chapman. Sorry, that got into my head. <laughs> Casey Chambers. Sorry. Oh, oh wow. That makes more sense. Every day. week, <laughs> without fail, they ask for Casey Chambers. Am I not that's pretty it. enough or something? Don't know okay. why. No, that's, and we always make a reference to it, but yeah. they keep every week asking the same thing. And I'm telling you, it's after a while, you're like, oh, we're going to have to learn this oh, song. From the, young, from the young ones, Mr. Brightside. Yeah. Uh, right that's yeah. always a killer. We played that in our set list anyways, because that song just goes off. Actually, oh, yeah. do both of you, do both of you have a song or songs that you will just like no nah, I'll never fucking play that mm. yep sweet child of mine I'll never learn that <laughs> <laughs> and we had a gig and someone said I'll do it like the singer who was filling in was like I bleh. and I literally was like it's not happening I played the song on bass I'm not saying the song's bad yeah. I don't want to play it on guitar just oh, yeah, something that's hard, about man. it in high school just listening to kids getting it wrong so much. I fumble through it. Um, PTSD. I fumble through it as an acoustic version, and everybody singing along just gets me through it to the point to where the solo comes, and I don't play lead guitar. So I'm just like, and I'm out. <laughs> and they're like, oh, he fucking tried it. I'd say that's about the only one I know. Do you have one, Dean? Do you have one that you just won't play? Hey, son. Oh, really? Just because, really? like, I think it's also also I think it's a good song. 
But there are just so many verses that I'm like, my brain cannot <laughs> fucking remember all that shit. <laughs> <laughs> but I play, but I say, what about Flame Trees? And they go, all right then. <laughs> nice, nice. You know, there's some songs, I don't know if you've ever experienced this thing, but some songs come with an attachment. Yeah. Like, um, what's the one where if you play it, they all drop their pants? Oh, oh Eagle no. Rock. Eagle Rock. Why? The best. I've had that go. <laughs> it's, it's honestly, it's very interesting. and I never knew the phenomenon. Yeah. I just saw a group of 10 guys yeah. stand up on <laughs> Rottnest Island and we were playing this gig. It was New Year's Eve Eve. So we were the night before just getting the locals ready on this big DJ stage set up for a DJ. But they were like, we'll put the duo on. So we sat there and we started playing it. And I've just never seen a table of dudes just yeah. drop their pants yeah. and dance. And so some venues won't allow it because they know that's what will happen. Yeah. And if you do it, you're going to elicit some sort of yeah. bad nudity. response. But they, <laughs> people, yeah, nudity. I, they, like, get, it happens every time. hilarious, man. It's hilarious. I sometimes um, film the crowd from behind me or from the side of stage and, like, cut it together of the best moments. And I played it once. All the dudes, pants down. <laughs> There's also a girl, I didn't notice it at the time, undies down to the ankles. I left a dress, like, so that nothing was shine. But I was, I watched it back. I'm like, what? I didn't see that. <laughs> but the first time I experienced the phenomenon was like maybe 15 years ago. I reckon it started. Do you reckon? Yeah, I think so. I've seen it at a wedding, like the groom yeah, wow. and everyone, like to the point where you're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know about this. The first time it happened to me, I was, I mean, I hate to say I was kind of. I wasn't hating it. It was like a. Neither was I, because I. I, <laughs> it was a no, I just thought this. It was a presentation this. night for a whole bunch of different female hockey grades or something. <laughs> now I like, play it, play it, play it. I'm like, I didn't even know it back then. Like, but I, I'm like, all right, I'll fucking play it. I'll try to fumble through it. And I did it. And they were up on stage with me, and the pants went down. Well, the skirts went down. I was like, what the fuck? Pants down. I'm learning. I'm learning this song. <laughs> It's scary. We're not allowed to play. Um, we're not allowed to play "Killing in the Name of." Oh yeah, yeah. Oh wow. What? Why? Do people get yeah. too rowdy? They do. Absolutely. Yeah. I play it. Oh, I can. I can understand that. On I Friday will. nights, I play it, and it's our ending song. Yeah. Because at it's that Amps? and Joker and the Thief at Amps. That and yeah. Joker and the Thief. Oh, that's two great final songs. They just, they just is it. But "Killing in the Name of" there's something about it. Yeah. Uh, and they, and especially when I'm the one that's like, I won't do what you tell me like mm. fuck you I won't do what you tell me and you yell it at them they yell it back and oh, so, yeah. but we can't do that at the Mustang bar yeah. too many yeah, fights wow. break out too many and, fights no I'm serious man it's it's had problems I was never there when it happened I wasn't in the band at the time but but now there's they've been like we, so we have it in a medley where we cut off just before oh, it kicks in mm-hmm. and like I was like why can't we just play the whole song and they were like we got told by management we can no longer do it because every time we used to play it the guys would get way too rowdy. Yeah. Security guards would have to start getting involved, yeah. and it just it just enlisted this like it does, yeah. primal mm-hmm. instinct. Horses is a, another classic yeah. example of like mm-hmm. a sing along that, yeah. without fail, yeah. always work. Oh, sweet, mm-hmm. sweet so Caroline. Ba, ba, yeah. ba. Everyone sings that bit. Oh, you gotta be place... careful. Sorry, John. I was gonna say the only place I've seen. Horses not work, and it was the funniest thing. Was um, I was this is going back years, and right right after I got out of, of school, there was like uh, we got a, a few of us got asked if we wanted to do a charity gig for um, cancer research or something rather, um, and it was some you know floofy event with lots of celebrities and whatnot, and you know Carrie Ann Kennelly was like fucking right there and things like that, and. Um, so basically, there was just a few of us who, midway through all the different performances, we'd come up on stage and do this little bit about being like construction workers who get fucked up by, you know, whatever shit that's getting... It was something, it was like, it wasn't asbestos, but it was something else um, like that. But it was, yeah, one of these charity events that all these uh, rich people rock up to and get pissed and say, like, I'm, I'm helping. And, um, <laughs> you know, Paulini was performing. And uh, but Anthony Kalia, there's a whole host of people from uh, ex, you know, Australian Idol stars who were fucking singing at it. But Anthony Kalia was singing towards 
the the end. And by that time, everyone's fucking pissed. You know, we went on halfway through, and yeah, Carrie Ann Kennelly was right there, and she was pissed as a net. It was great. But um, <laughs> Anthony Anthony Clear went up on the stage to sing, and no one gave a single fuck. Wow. Like, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, um, he's clearly he's clearly gotten up there and gone you know what'll save this horses <laughs> yeah. and, uh, it always does right, he, man? Starts singing, he starts singing horses and everyone continues to not give a fuck wow <laughs> we're watching it from the side but he does the worst thing he probably could have done was he starts going come on sing it with me you know the words it's like everyone and it just was I was going Oh, just man, just like stop Ouch. doing that. But uh, yeah, but like it was a closed, it was a closed event. Whatever, I'm sure he's fine. But like I was watching you going, like, dude, no one gives a fuck. Everyone's oh, drunk. Read the room. Yeah, Ouch. Uh, read the room. Insane. Harry Styles did it two weeks ago when I went yeah. to see him with my missus. I was not expecting it, and he did a very good job of it. Yeah, and he even had a very lovely thing to say about it. He goes, "You probably don't hear this song that often." Uh, but when you do, it like speaks to you, mm. and it, it like the way in which he said it, and, and I, everyone sang along. And even at like, um, even just like at a few other times, I've had it at, at gigs, and it'll be the one song that the person that hasn't moved, yeah, and hasn't done anything mm. all night, mm. and hasn't responded at all to you mm. as entertainers or anything like that, will just go, yeah. I wonder what it is. It's, it's just, it, it, I don't know. It's just something about it. That um, chorus, man. Like some, something, something about, about is it something about like the freedom of like riding horses on the beaches, or the beach or some shit? Like maybe. It, it's very Australian, uh, a style song. Like it's inherently just for us. Like you play that somewhere else. Like when yeah. I don't think, think horses would work in America or anything. <laughs> no, no. Like, oh. And we, weirdly, weirdly, the verses are all about birds. And then the chorus is about horses. Man, like yeah. We will fly way up high, like, we will, like a beautiful bird, and all that. Like it's all birds. It's like, oh, yeah. <laughs> it is a very freeing What's song. Like you just, here? you definitely kind of feel a breeze when you when you hear it. Yeah. Mm. You can absolutely. Do you guys have the equivalent of anything like that in, uh, I guess, in in movies or in even even in acting? Something that you just will something that I won't do. Maybe oh, never. Oh. One that you know. One thing that you know works. Cause I think that was kind of cool, like a song or a technique that you think always works. And one thing that you just will never do could be acting or it could be directing. Uh, uh, one thing that I will never do. <clears throat> well, I mean, yeah. The thought I immediately, the thought I immediately <laughs> thought was um, watching watching Jim and Andy. Have you guys seen that documentary? Oh yeah, how good is that? Oh, it's great. But um, the one on. the one thing that I would never do is to take my acting to a point where it uh, it uh, all consuming. Not all consuming, but was actively a pain in the ass for everyone else on mm. set. Where it's actively yes. making Definitely. everyone's job harder. Yes. If you are being a cunt to the other actors on set, in the name of your character, no, just just selfish. Just stop. Selfish. That right? really frustrated yeah. me. With the documentary. I was like, I get it. It's a whole you're doing a Kaufman esque thing, but yeah. man, when everyone fucking hates you for it, like yeah, that was, doing... and you could see the director mm. struggling, like, oh man, I just need you to be here, present, mm. and he, that yeah. was that's rough. That's a good one. Yeah, man, I agree with that. Mm. Because you're taking the choice away from everybody else, aren't you? They're like, this is the way I'm fucking doing it. You have to like call me by the name of the character. Or... It's such a selfish choice, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. If you're just if you're getting in the way of the other the other people's process of doing what they're doing, you're just mm. annoying. Yeah. 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 There's absolutely no need no. for it. It's an interesting kind of thing because there's so much pressure on the star. You know, I mean. If you're Jim Carrey in a in a movie, I mean the the amount of pre- I can't I couldn't even fathom the amount of pressure on on his shoulders. And there's a weird thing that seems to happen where people are put under immense pressure and have a, a decent amount of power, mm. and they just seem to yeah. It seems you know I'm not going to go with the cliche of you know power corrupts, but it's it seems too common that as soon as you get to a certain point, there's a certain amount of pressure on you, mm. and you have a certain amount of I can do it, and no one can really stop me. 
people just start making shitty choices. Mm. Yeah, they, yeah. Just don't, don't somehow don't consider others. Like they just no, were... just fucking you know, Pirates of the Caribbean, an entire crew of God knows how many people sitting around waiting for Johnny Depp to rock up, and he's still asleep, getting fucking smashed. Wow. And you're like, uh, you know, they, they've got. There was a, a a PA on Pirates that told me they. They, their job was to just sit in a car down the street from the house that he was staying in in Queensland. And their job was just to wait for him to come out of the house and then just ring the crew, just ring set when he appeared so that everyone could just, you know, start <laughs> getting up and getting back into it. And this is like four hours after the shoot was meant to have started. Like it was like the, the amount of money just being burnt, just waiting the, on one yeah, dude. The word like, come on, is rock up. Gone there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's... I don't, I don't understand. If you were like that at, like, a, if you did... If any... Anyone at a low level did that, you are Fine. gone. You would be, gone. yeah. Come back. And you I would. mean, the industry, the story would just keep echoing, and it would just be like, are you serious? Um, but you're right. Sometimes a big sob, big situation. I wonder what that is. Is that a sense of, like, they feel like they are godlike, or is it just a sense of not caring? Mm. I think it's the pressure. I think there's so much pressure that they then they go, you know, the only way I'm going to do this is my way. Did it, and then they sort of slip. Did it coincide with him dating that? Oh, yeah. I don't want to use you know what? the that words that, that come could, to my that, mind. That could have had a... Permit. Yeah, that, that, that could have definitely had something to do with it. I mean, it was around the... Or the dog situation. That similar time. Tried yeah. to take the dog into the maybe... Yeah, I think it was either the one previous to that I feel like or that one. Um... But you know, the, the, I mean, it's too it's too pervasive. Like that's that's one scenario. But there's so many other examples. I mean, Val oh, Kilmer yeah. on uh, on some things, Marlon Brando on some things, mm. and like, don't get me wrong, you know, um, all these are great actors, you know. But there's just no need to, to no, act no. like that. No, no. What's your um? What's your no? I wouldn't do a thing. Mitch. Me. Yeah. Porn. No, um, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't know. Um, like a, like a um, fans, you can make nineteen ninety-five. <laughs> 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 yeah. No. Look. I mean. I don't. I don't know. Hey. I don't really think there is no, nothing like your examples of like you know not being able to play a song or just putting your foot down and not playing. So genre. Yeah. And you've never direct or write. Yeah, sure. Actually, actually, you know, this is going to be a very unpopular opinion, and I. I'd like to think that I'd stick to my guns on this, but check back in. But there's this tendency that happened. I mean, I'd be so blessed if this scenario even happened in the first place. It's unlikely to happen. But it seems like anyone that does a breakout indie film gets approached by a, you know, by a Marvel or a Disney or whatever to then just do the next big thing or a next episode of Mandalorian or whatever. And my, my deep gut feeling is that I don't want to do a studio film because you just see it happen over and over again. You see it with David Lynch, you see it with Alex Preuss, you see it with, you know, all these auteurs that are actual artists that are trying to make a certain film and have it, you know, Edgar Wright, another example, happened to him twice, Scott Pilgrim, and then um, Ant-Man, which he wrote but then was going to direct and then they created differences, and he stepped away, and he stepped away, which I think is the, was the right decision. But you see this thing where you have someone that has this huge artistic vision and then they're put into a studio film where you've got like 30 executives breathing down your neck and, you know, pixel fucking you in the, in the rushes. And then you have this film come out that's leveraging your, you know, success. newfound sort of fame and success and, yeah, audience and, and all that. But the thing that is to your name isn't yours. And if it bombs, like David Lynch with Dune, it's just like, it's just a shit time for everyone and then you're sort of blacklisted and never really asked to do anything else. And I just, I'm just so not about that. The money's not worth it. I'd rather keep making Yeah. Um, there is there'll be situations where I'd try and negotiate something if I had any leverage whatsoever, which I don't. But um, we'll yeah, honestly, yeah. If we if we're talking for fingers crossed, but yeah, if we're talking things that I, like I won't do, I would I would really reconsider whether or not that's the actual yeah route I want to take. Can we that's do a good one, actually because that's the same as like a record label. I had that yeah. discussion with a few people today. If a, back in the, in the 80s and 90s when when musicians didn't really have too much education, and the record label would be we're recording your next thing and there's no mm. discussion about ownership of anything mm -hmm. it's just you know what would you do in a situation like that if 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 every if, if the way was to be paved for you mm -hmm. you know freely <clears throat> uh, you know and i think that's a problem with a lot of musicians back in the day and this discussion of and you can see it a lot now with people like taylor swift coming out with taylor's mm -hmm. version and, and kiss you know re-recording a lot of their songs or yeah that's right yeah because 
state, there was an education at the time, and they were offered something so spectacular. But, you know, and it'd be like, essentially, you being like, hey, you want to do the next Thor or the new the mm-hmm. next Marvel film? And you'd have to ask the question, like, oh, like, I don't think, you know, nowadays, back then, it's like, yeah, why do I have to lose everything? Um, yes. At the time, it doesn't feel like that. Yeah. It's like, mm. yes, rising higher, getting bigger. Mm. Now it's like, oh. Making it. Yeah, making it. That's not the definition of... And you're, mm. and you're making this much for the money. Back in that day, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That much. Mm-hmm. That's, and I think that's just terrible at the end of it. Especially with music. <sighs> especially when you see the rights to bands like the Beatles just passed around like... Just there you go, Michael Jackson. There you go. Who wants to buy it next? Mm. You know, like it's just—it's literally just oh, commodifying it's, art. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. Mm. And meanwhile, a lot of those musicians still have to play. Yeah, um, yeah, to pay off the debt, right? Still have to play. To play, you know, you look at other—maybe uh, not to that the Beatles level, but you look at lower level versions of that, where you see the musos still kicking about and you just and and then it doesn't look very you know that they're not having fun or mm-hmm. oh, it's something about it it's like they've been stung oh, yeah. by the corporate b of like yep. of the record labels and stuff like that and it's just yep. scary i think i heard recently as well justin bieber just sold a whole bunch of his rights mm-hmm. for 200 it was million. like 200 million yeah. yeah i mean it is 200 million as well mm-hmm. but at the same time you know, like I think I heard George Lucas obviously would same with Disney, but he still wanted to keep the is it the merch? Is that right? Mm. He still wanted to keep the rights. Oh, I don't know if Disney would have agreed to him keeping merch. Like. I think he, I think he kept um, kept some. Yeah, don't don't don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll need fact checking on this, but I believe that he just kept an executive say over the story. So if he didn't like the direction it started going, he could still actually step in and go, "Let's not. Let's we're not going this way." Is that still? I, I, mean, I think they could still squash that and be like, "Yeah." Yeah, I don't know. Hey, I, I know for a fact that um, with the Spider-Man movies, because um, they were some of the earliest ones, I mean, those ones that weren't really through the whole, you know, quote-unquote Marvel, um, you know, cinematic universe, but um, those early ones were done by Sony, the, the Sam Raimi ones. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, and so then when Marvel was doing all their thing and they wanted to start making Spider-Man movies, they basically had to have that conversation with Sony, and they went, you, Sony, can keep all of the profits from all of the... Spider-Man movies that we make, but we're keeping merch, and that shows you where the money is. Merch Whoa, is like merch. Ba- movies these days. The Dis- Disney, especially the movies, are basically just long-form advertisements. They are no, absolutely. for the toys and the lunchbox and the bed sheets and the just like the uh, the song, the singing competitions that we all know well. They're actually mm. advertisements for the artists that are judging, right? Totally. Totally, oh, aren't they? Yeah, they are, they are. And you got bloody uh, saw saw a little breakdown of it recently. But Survivor, it was on a Media Watch, ABC's Media Watch. And it was for Survivor, and it was just like the blatant product placement of just like if you win this season of Survivor, you get the choice between an Isuzu D Max Ultra mm. or an Isuzu D Max something else. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and then there was another thing where it was you know for KFC, and it was just like the winner of this competition to get eat the KFC, you know. It's just like, mm, let's just make it a little bit more blatant, shall we? Yeah. Did we do <laughs> Mitch's and John's old mate of the week? We have not yet, John. Oh, sorry, you got an old mate? Straight. Sorry to put you on the spot. Is it the horses that John has behind him galloping in the wind over his head? I yes. Just so I've got that one, and I've got a matching one up here that's of a matador, like, um, oh, yeah. being like, fuck you. Sweet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, have you got an old mate, or do you want me to jump in while you're thinking? I was about to say there's going to be a lot of dead air to fucking delete. That's right. You jump in, you jump in. Sorry, bro. Right. Sorry, bro. Um, my, my old mate, yesterday, um, I was on the way out, and popped downstairs for uh, one of those Barocca things, when you mm-hmm. twist the top off and it drops the Barocca in. I just needed a needed energy. You hung and I went down to the 7-Eleven downstairs. I will neither confirm or deny <laughs> these allegations. And, uh, no, I wasn't actually. Um, I'm sorry. And... Uh, uh, yeah, went to the went to the Seven Eleven downstairs, and the, they were switching who was behind the counter. And so there's this guy, and so I go in there, grab the grab the thing, introduces himself. His name is Ibrahim, and he's an absolute legend. He's a uh, a liver surgeon 
who's just moved here. He's waiting for his, you know, all the all the residency documents and, and such things. So apparently June is the will be the time. But in the meantime, yeah, he's working at a at a Seven Eleven. But he's like, yeah, man, six six p.m. to six a.m. I'm there, or maybe it was like eight p.m. to to six a.m. There, you know, five days a week. Come down, have a chat. Yeah. So when I got back from where I was and uh, and housemate uh, who you guys have met, Harry. Um, arrived home from Melbourne at the exact same time as I was pulling up, so I introduced him to, to Ibrahim, and uh, yeah, it was great. So Ibrahim downstairs at the, the Kuji 7-Eleven, Kuji City Mart, absolute legend of a bloke, and he's a, he's a liver surgeon. I see that a lot, man, with dudes that work in those jobs. Yeah, like right. They've come they, they maybe from a, di- from a different country, they're highly qualified there, but they have to start from scratch here. Have to start mm. from scratch what? here. It's crazy, it's crazy. The only silver lining, really, is that he is actually, like, making paths yeah, to, on him. to doing that here. Um, but very eloquent dude, and you could definitely see, like, you know, yeah, yeah. critically thinking dude. If the yeah. accreditation pulls over, then then it's okay. But for a lot mm. of people, the accreditation doesn't pull over. So whether they're a doctor or whether it's a trade, mm-hmm. it's not recognized. And they Easy. have to start again. I um, edited for a long time. There's, like, the Entrepreneur of the Year um, business awards and they would do the you know all around australia and they have a bunch of people in each state kind of verse each other with you know you have to cut all these videos down they talk for like two hours and i have to cut it down to like 50 seconds each and so i'm sitting there listening to like two hours of these people like just their whole life story and doing that for like i don't know six or seven people each state and then there's the finalists and they do another piece and then you have like the, the six or seven of them um and then you know one gets chosen and they're sort of you know supporting um you know immigrants and and, and you know um, skill workers and people are just like you know starting from nothing and now they're here sort of thing mm. um, you know it's sort of the zero to hero story um, and there's so many of them I did this for probably three or four years so lots of interviews and there's um, so many people that like yeah had skill sets like major like they're, they're you know pharmacists or something mm. you know in India mm-hmm. making absolute bank come to Australia not credited um, doesn't doesn't cross over and then they end up like I think one dude, he ended up just importing drugs, legal, <laughs> legal drugs, um, <laughs> importing like pharmaceuticals for a fraction of the cost and then supplying them to, to pharmacies mm. and made this like separate massive business based on what he knew, but going into business, which didn't have those same kind of regu- regulations. And it made an absolute killing. Yeah, wow. So anyway, he, uh, yeah, Ibrahim was my, was my old mate of the week. I think my old mate of the week is this truck driver. It's kind of, it's half old mate of the week, but also half old mate's situation. It's quite <laughs> funny. So, you know, truck driver comes up, he's this gruff, gruff old bloke. You know, grumbles everything at you. And, um, he unloads the truck, and no worries, he drives off. And sort of a couple of minutes later, he walks out of the back, and I'm just fucking around. Are you, uh, busy with the forklift? I'm like, uh, no, what are you after? He's like, oh, you give us a jump. I'm like, well, a jump. He's like, ah, oh. no, my battery's fucked. I'm like, what, jump you with the, uh, with the <laughs> I don't By the way, I should should preface, this is a fucking 10-ton truck, you know. It's a big, um, it's a big Kenworth, you know, like big oh Kenworth, Kenworth, Kenworth looking motherfucker with a, you know, with a uh, 10 ton trailer on the back. And, um, long leads for that shit. Was it a gas forklift or? No, no. Yeah, yeah a gas, gas forklift. <laughs> no, but here's the thing. He, he didn't mean a, he didn't mean a battery jump as in like connecting cables from a fork up to the battery. Oh. He, he meant wanted to roll start the fucker. <laughs> what? Oh. A ten ton truck. <laughs> so, so I was like, all right, okay, cool. And um, you know, it would drive drive around to where he's his, his giant fucking truck is just uh, is there dead. And um, yeah, I just drive up to the back with a forklift, tines are underneath it, and I and I get off. He's like, right, I'm gonna put it in, you know, put it in gear, take the clutch on, and just you know, when I give you the thumb, just start pushing. And um, shit. Like, I'm like, with well, the fork, fork pushing? Like it's a you know, big gas fork's pretty strong, but um, yeah. And then uh, sure enough, his thumb comes out, and I just start going, and I'm pushing this giant truck. <laughs> and then it just, as you do when you're jump starting, there's you know your car just has a big lurch and a big oh. bounce. Oh no! Giant no. truck, and it just goes boom boom. 
And um, as the engine turns over, and I'm just immediately like, oh, I'm putting this in reverse. (laughs) (laughs) But no, no. So I'm just pushing this fucking giant truck along. And yeah, sure enough, the engine turns over and he he, he starts going. And um, and I pull to the side so I can see him in the rear view mirror. And you just get one of these, just the like... (laughs) As he drives off around the corner. And I'm just like, fuck, okay, that's now something that you've done. You've uh, all started a fucking, you know, 10 tonner with a a forklift. The real old man of that story is you, John. Did anyone get any footage of that? No. Please tell me someone recorded you starting a 10 ton truck with a forklift. I feel like that could go sideways if that footage was put out. Oh, absolutely. I felt like like the way that it bounced, I thought it was going to fucking kick back at me. I shat myself. But I'm just like, cool, that's a thing that, that works. Well... I mean, <laughs> but it was one of those situations where you're going, what, I just, I, is, is that, is that going to work if I push it? He's like, yeah, no, nah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. I've done it before, but. <laughs> I've done it before. I'm like, all right, we'll, we'll give it a go. For a second, I was thinking, Two, he yeah. thought your, your physicality was big enough that you could fucking push it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was fucking so good, just. That's awesome. That is a great story. Oh my gosh. God damn. Wow. That's a good one. Hells yeah. They were they were four decent old mates of the lake. Mine was I actually I just have to say, I don't know if mine was actually the girl herself, but maybe the guy that died. Maybe he was the old mate. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's what it was. He just got to just got old. Just, maybe he was just know, sick of I... maybe he was sick of her um, lack of communication oh, skills. And... Yeah. <laughs> I know, that's I, I, that's what I'm thinking because it was just. I don't want to live with saying... this fucking incommunicative bitch anymore. Mate. That's like saying <laughs> hamburger and being like, "Do you want one? Are you hungry for one?" <laughs> hamburger, like no context, and you're like, "Oh wait, this is a song." Yeah. Uh, we'll lose. So rogue. So I will rogue. forever be wondering which song she really meant. Yeah, no. I'm, I know, give me a reason. Give Is there like, a song called A Reason? And she was like, I thought it give was, me a reason. I, I remember she put it on Spotify. I don't remember it being Trace Chapman because I would have seen that. I like I would have been head, right? Give me a reason to love me, to reason, be a woman. I thought it was like a Hooper's Stank. Not Hooper's Stank. Give me a reason to be. <laughs> The course yeah, of that is give me a reason, isn't it? I really wish the Chase Chapman one, because that's a great tune. Oh, isn't it just? Oh, that is a good song. There's a fu- I just well, there's an absolute fucking banging live version where she plays plays it with Eric Clapton, mm. and um, oh wow, and they they alternate verses. Yeah. Oh, oh wow. wow! Oh, I'm checking that one out. I'm oh, checking that one out. She's so She sings the ver- first part, and then it just like you know, Eric Clapton's just like doing his fucking you know funky Eric Clapton thing, but then he just comes in, just going, "Baby, I got your number. Oh, wow. I know that you got mine." And it's just like, wow. ha, 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 fuck. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. It, it gradually it shifts keys the whole way through, doesn't it, Mason? Ooh, yeah. Does it? yeah, yeah, keeps going up, up and up. Oh, wow. 1999, is this the one? Might be. Get on stage. Yeah. This is. Oh yeah, he's just shredding. I like this. This is great. <laughs> what a reference! Look, the best thing we got out of this old mate, crazy chap. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching the old mate yarns podcast. Not a podcast. Thanks for the Reddit questions. <laughs>